Think back to your chemistry class in high school. What do you remember from that class? Maybe you remember some labs with test tubes and goggles. Maybe you remember some Bunsen burners and a few stray fires throughout the year. Maybe you remember the periodic table hanging on the wall. Maybe you remember having to balance some equations or do some other sort of dreadful math. But I bet you don't remember a lot of stories being told in that chemistry class. Now do the same for your biology class. Think back, what do you remember from that class? Maybe you remember dissecting some animals, or maybe you remember looking at some pond scum under a microscope. Maybe a picture of Charles Darwin and his big bushy beard. But again, I bet you don't remember a lot of stories in this class. And this might seem kind of an odd question for me to even ask. I mean, what do stories have to do with science? Well, the answer is maybe more than you think. Because it turns out that the human brain remembers information best when it's presented in a story form. And on some level, I think we all know this. If you give human beings stray data, you know, random dates and facts, stuff like that, we are terrible about remembering that information. We misremember it, we butcher it, we forget it completely. We're terrible with that type of information. But if you give us a story, something with a beginning, a middle, an end, with characters, conflict, and drama, we're very good about remembering that type of information. There's a couple of reasons for that. One has to do with emotions. So you might know that emotions are very important for forming and storing memories. That's why really emotional moments in our lives, we remember them quite well. They're very vivid. Whether they're happy memories, embarrassing ones, sad ones, they're very vivid because emotions help form and store memories. Well, what do stories do? They evoke our emotions. They make us happy, sad, angry, whatever the case may be. And because of those emotions, we're able to remember the stories better. And the other reason humans are so good at remembering stories has to do with our evolutionary history. We are social creatures, and we evolved in groups. And group dynamics are very, very important to us. Well, what are stories, if, what are they if not studies in group dynamics? Even little kids can remember information pretty well in a story form. They can handle really complex plots. You know, who betrayed whom? Who's allied with whom? Who the heroes and villains are? The good guys and bad guys? They're very good about remembering that information, as are human beings in general. And I think that science education could benefit from having more stories involved in it. And right now, I would like to uh, go through an example of what I think is a very good case, a, an example of using a story to learn science. And that story has to do with this man right here, Niccolo Paganini. He is usually considered the greatest violinist who ever lived. He was active in Europe in the very early 1800s, and every king, every pope, every queen, every empress wanted Paganini to come play for them because he was the absolute best violinist in the entire world. In fact, there were stories circulating about Paganini. Uh, you might have heard these stories about often blues musicians nowadays, that they sold their soul to Satan in order to get their talent. Well, a lot of those stories actually started with Paganini. There were rumors that he was so good at the violin, there was no way he could have been this good unless he had sold his soul to the devil, made a pact with Satan in order to get his talent. That is how good Paganini was. Well, it turns out there were actually some nonfiction reasons Paganini was so good as well. And one of those reasons had to do with his amazingly, even sort of freakishly, flexible hands. So one thing he could do with his hands, and you can try this in the audience right now, he could take his hands like this, his pinky, and he could reach his pinky out, and he could put his pinky at a right angle with the rest of his hand just by stretching it out to the side like that. It actually gets worse because he could also take his hand, he could put it flat down on a table, you can try this too, put it flat down on a surface, and he could raise his pinky and his thumb, and while keeping his hand flat on that surface, he could touch his pinky and his thumb behind his hand while it was still flat. 
So he could do things with his hands you should not do with your hands in polite company. But it made him, it made him an amazing violinist because he could stretch his hands incredibly wide. He could do fingerings that no one else could do and play notes faster than any other violinist could. So his hands gave him a big advantage. And in addition to being very uh, flexible, his hands were very strong as well. This is a cast of his hands right here. There's a story about how strong his hands were. He was at a dinner party once. And there was another violinist there and some other people. And everyone was sort of cooing and awing over Paganini, what an amazing violinist he was. And the other violinist uh, kind of uh, spoke up and he said, well, you know, flexibility is important for a violinist's hands, but strength is important too. Very strong hands. And I bet I have stronger hands than you do, Paganini. And Paganini said, really? So he reached down and he picked up a plate off the table. And he was holding it like this. And he held it there for a moment. And then he went like that. And Paganini snapped the plate in half with just his thumb by doing that. It was kind of like Bruce Lee's famous one-inch punch in that his thumb didn't travel very far. But it really packed a wallop in the short distance that it traveled. And the other violinist tried this. He couldn't do it. No one else at the party could do it except for Paganini and his amazing hands. And from a modern perspective, especially the clue about how flexible his hands are, or his hands were, it's almost certain that he had a genetic disorder of some sort, probably a connective tissue disorder. Because it wasn't just his hands that were so amazingly flexible. He could bend his elbows the wrong way. His knees would bend backwards. He was essentially like a circus rubber man. He could twist himself into pretzels and knots. And in fact, when Paganini would go up on stage, he would go into these amazing poses. He would start writhing at the height of the music, going into all of these twisted poses. And it was just more fodder for people to whisper about how he must be aligned with the devil. Look at these demonic things he's doing on stage. And of course, the more people spread these rumors, the more notorious he became and the more popular he became. It really worked out in his benefit. But, you know, unfortunately, uh, these connective tissues and disorders, even though they were an advantage for Paganini, they do have their downsides to people's health in that these disorders can weaken the heart, they can weaken the blood vessels, and people who have them often die younger than they would have normally. And that happened to Paganini. He died when he was in his 50s, probably in large part because of this disorder. And after he died, the Catholic Church actually would not allow Paganini to be buried in a church graveyard. They banished him to an unsanctified graveyard, sort of on the outskirts of town, because they didn't want someone in league with the devil to be buried in holy ground. And I like this as a science story for a couple of reasons. One is that we usually think about something like DNA, genetics, a science being on one end of a spectrum, and something like music, a fine art, being on another end of a spectrum, and sort of, you know, never the twain shall meet. But in this case, if you know something about the science and you know something about the music, you see they actually complement each other. And in fact, you can't get the whole story unless you know about both the music and the science. You need them both to get a, the bigger picture. And that's something I really strive to do and get across when I'm telling science stories. I want to show people that science doesn't just end when the classroom bell rings or when lab's over. You can forget about it. You can make connections between science and pretty much any other field that you want to talk about. With DNA and genes alone, you can talk about DNA and music. Talk about DNA and art, people actually using DNA or genes to make living art. Talk about DNA and archaeology. DNA and computing, actually using DNA to store and process information. Do the same thing with the periodic table or other iconic things in science. There's always a connection out there to something bigger. And the other reason I like this as a science story is that I think it, ha it really shows where the field of genetics is going. There's a good lesson there about the future of the field. Because a lot of people, a lot of geneticists, you talk to them nowadays, they're not interested in single genes. They're interested in gene-environment interactions, things like that. And Paganini is a good example of this. Because Paganini, yes, he had these amazingly flexible hands from his genes, from his DNA. But he was also a very hard worker, and he loved playing and practicing music. He also grew up in a time and a place, and was active in a time and a place, Europe, the very early 1800s, that rewarded the type of music that he played. 
So it wasn't just his hands, his DNA. It was his DNA working with his temperament, his environment, all of those things coming together in sort of a perfect storm to make him the most amazing violinist in the world. And again, if you talk to geneticists, that's where the field is going. They don't talk about single genes. They talk about systems of genes, gene-environment interactions. You really need to know all of those things. Because your DNA is important. It's a big part of who you are. But it's not all of who you are. You need the temperament. You need the environment to take those things into account. And I think Paganini's story encapsulates all of that in a really nice, concise way. And so again, it's a really good example, I think, of a science story. Because yes, this was a story on the surface about a violinist and the wild life that he led. But there was a lot of interesting science buried in his life story as well. And yeah, I could have gotten up here and talked to you about how DNA works, the parts of a cell, the environmental triggers for genes, all that sort of stuff. And honestly, you probably would have forgotten half or more of it by the time you left the auditorium. So information like that doesn't stick in the human brain. But by embedding it in a story, making it a little bit more vivid, hopefully it was more memorable. And maybe you even learned a little bit of science against your will. So if you are an educator, you know, a science teacher, a science writer like me, whatever the case may be, consider using stories to get the science across. Stories certainly can't replace things like test tubes and labs. They can't replace having to balance equations or doing some dreadful math. But you can get a lot farther with stories and science than you might think. Thank you, everyone.